This is Ed Driscoll for PajamasMedia.com, and we're talking with Roger Kimball, the editor of the New Criterion magazine, the publisher of Encounter Books, and a blogger at Pajamas Media. And Roger, with all of that on your plate and more, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. I'm always happy to talk to you, Ed. The New Criterion is about to celebrate its 30th anniversary. And for someone who's never read the magazine before, could you tell us about it and how it was founded and where it stands today? Absolutely. Well, I'm sure that none of your listeners are in the unhappy position of never having heard of the New Criterion. But some of your listeners may know people who haven't. So let's begin at the beginning. Uh, Back in 1982, Hilton Kramer, then the chief art critic for the New York Times, and his friend Samuel Littman, the pianist and music critic, uh, decided that the cultural landscape was looking a little bleak. I'm not sure that the name political correctness had been uh, actually invented back in 1982, but that was certainly one of the things that the new criterion was founded to combat. That is to say, a uh, kind of intellectual conformity and narrow-mindedness and uh, an unwillingness to speak the truth about important cultural issues. And uh, the magazine's first, first, uh, first number rolled off the presses in, 19, uh, in, in September 1982 and uh, became an instant hit. It, uh, I think the magazine owed a lot to its enemies uh, because of Sam Littman's position at the, uh, on the Council of the National Endowment for the Arts. It was somehow assumed that we had a red phone on on, uh, on the editor's desk that went directly to the Reagan White House. And I won't uh, confirm or deny that rumor. <laughs> but um, but uh, I think that the, the people who didn't like what we were doing, who the people who didn't think that uh, it was important to stand up for high critical standards or uh, to, to um, uh, 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 ridicule that which, which was ridiculous in the... Uh, uh, realm of art and culture. Those people didn't like what we were doing, and they made a lot of noise about it. Uh, there were articles about the new criterion in The Nation and in The New Republic. I remember when I published my book, Tenured Radicals, in 1990, uh, which was kind of came out of the new criterion, the Village Voice ran on their cover a kind of Wild West poster. It said, Wanted, and there was my picture along with people like Alan Bloom and and others saying wanted and and we were somehow we were we were the bad guys and of course all this did was uh to create a lot of energy and buzz and enthusiasm for the new criterion and um uh it's been a it's been a great 30 years for the magazine and uh uh i i'm not saying that uh that our subscription base is quite as large as that of the the Wall Street journals but uh, it's about 10 times larger than uh, T.S. Eliot's magazine, The Criterion, for which we are named and in many ways uh, after which we're patterned. And that was one of the most influential magazines of the last century. And so I like to think of The New Criterion as being one of the most influential uh, of, of, of this century. Roger, how much does the state of culture, both high and low, say about the society that produces it? Well, frankly, Ed, um, I, I think it says almost everything. You know, it's it's difficult when we're kind of caught up in the, uh, you know, the rush of the moment. Whether that's uh, here, I am on Long Island Sound, uh, worrying about Hurricane I- Irene. We're uh, kind of moving all the furniture up to the second story and taping our windows and doing stuff like that. But you know, that's uh, we'll forget about that uh, in a, in a few days. Uh, uh, and similarly, you know, everybody's eyes are on. Uh, uh, um, the, the president's vacation in Martha's Vineyard, um, uh, that seems to be a perennial story. Uh, every time I see a picture of the president, he's in a, a golf cart or making a putt, uh, you know, taking care of the nation's business by uh, staying out of Washington. But that, you know, that's ephemeral stuff, really. What matters are the values that a culture embraces. And you can really tell a lot about a culture by what it cares about. Like you ask somebody, what, what, what really matters to you? They might say any kind of thing, but the way you can really tell is by that person's desires and behavior. What he does tells you what, he, what matters to him. And I think that um, uh, that's really the, that's the realm of culture. You know, what, what we 
what we care about, what we cherish, what we actually, you know, fight for. And the new criterion is all about looking over uh, the, the vast expanse of our culture and battling what I call cultural amnesia. The fact that uh, for many people, the ancient history seems to be what happened, um, uh, you know, two years ago or six months ago or at most a decade ago. Well, that doesn't tell you very much. You need to have roots uh, that go a little deeper if you're to understand where we are now. And that's really what the new criterion is all about. We're serious without being academic. And, uh, you know, we try to be lively, but without being, you know, trendy or, or, or meretricious. And so we think that, uh, you know, looking back over, what should we call it, mankind's adventures in time from the, the beginning until today is really a great way of understanding where we are now and some of the problems that we face as a, uh, a free people struggling uh, in the world. And so uh, we're just about to publish a huge double issue of the new criterion. In our September issue, it will be a collector's item, I'm sure. It's got all kinds of terrific pieces from the classics to what's going on right now at Ground Zero. So I, I hope that um, I hope that your listeners, uh, those few who don't subscribe to the new criterion, will be sure to uh, pick up a copy on the newsstand and maybe even uh, fill out the form and become a happy subscriber. Roger, you were talking about societal amnesia a few moments ago, and I have a somewhat related question. High culture used to be accessible to everyone. You might not listen to a symphony and instantly know the harmony in each chord being played, or instinctively grasp all of the nuances the artist intended in a painting or sculpture, but anyone could appreciate their beauty. Anyone could walk into a church and appreciate its architecture. But as Tom Wolfe noted in both The Painted Word and From Bauhaus to Our House, at some point in the 20th century, art became very insular, requiring the person viewing it to know its history and its backstory to understand its creator's intentions. What caused art to turn inward in this fashion? Well, I, th- I think, you know, a, a lot of things. And um, uh, speaking for myself, I don't think it uh, was, was, was a good thing. Um, uh, part of the modernist project, uh, uh, indeed, which T.S. Eliot was part of, uh, was this idea that, um, uh, of difficulty, that difficulty was in itself a good thing. I think that um, uh, being popular in the old sense of that word, that is to say, Um, being accessible is extremely important. That's why the new criterion, although it deals, as I say, with serious subjects, puts a very high premium on clarity and intelligibility. Uh, You know, we we think that, you know, uh, Dante is a very exciting person to read. We think that that Auden is a very good poet to read, that uh, uh, Haydn's symphonies, there's a lot to them. And they aren't arcane. They aren't, um, you know, they they aren't in themselves difficult. In a way, what the new criterion strives to be, from the point of view of a critical enterprise, is a kind of uh, a marriage broker. Really, we we want to sort of bring the person and the work together, and then get out of the way, because we believe that uh, the work can speak powerfully to people if only they, you know, are in the right kind of proximity and bring the right kind of attention to it. So I, I absolutely agree with you that um, the sort of hermetic turn that, uh, that we saw in, uh, in high culture in um, sort of the, the mid-20th century was unfortunate. And I think that, um, that uh, in many ways, the new criterion is at the forefront of, of battling that and returning to a Uh, a kind of sane populism. Roger, I wanted to ask you some questions about the other hat that you wear. The past several years have seen dramatic changes in the way books are sold and read. The Borders bookstore chain has gone out of business. Amazon's Kindle and other e-readers have proven to be very popular. How have all of these sweeping changes impacted Encounter Books? Um, well, I think they've, they've presented um, a huge opportunity. Uh, I mean, in some ways, it's a challenge, of course, because uh, the business model is um, a little different from what it was uh, even five years ago. 
um, even even less. I mean, three years ago, uh, e-books existed. We some of our titles were available as e-books, but it was a kind of novelty. You know, you could number the the, the copies sold uh, in, with the fingers of both hands. Well, now it's I don't know. Uh, in some cases, it's as much as 20% of the of titles total sales, and I, I'm sure that's going to going to grow. Um, uh, I think it's actually an incredibly exciting time to be in publishing because uh, although I'm sitting here in my study looking at all these uh, beautiful books on the shelves, um, those aren't going to go away. Those will still be published uh, and bought. And, uh, but uh, increasingly, people uh, in this business will understand that what they are really doing is not making this particular kind of object that has the, um, the covers and the pages in the middle. That's one way of doing it. But uh, they're in the business of purveying ideas. And it doesn't matter whether um, the ideas are uh, inscribed on a page or whether uh, uh, they're, they're on a, a digital screen. What matters is actually you know, getting the ideas out. And that's, uh, that's really what Encounter is about, you know, promoting serious debate, as we say in one of our mottos. And, uh, uh, you know, whether it's on pieces of paper or, uh, uh, you know, exists at, the, at the, the tap of your fingertip on an iPad or a Kindle, really doesn't matter. And, um, uh, frankly, I think that the next few years are going to be uh, very exciting for, for Encounter because we are poised, uh, you know, to take advantage of this technology. Last year, you published Grey Lady Down by William McGowan. Mm-hmm. Did you ever hear from anyone at the Times as to what they thought of the book? Uh, well, not directly. <laughs> um, my, my, my relations with the Times are um, uh, not exactly cordial. I, they, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, the book review uh, treated Encounter Books with uh, uh, contempt, so we decided not to send them our books any longer. We'd be delighted if they wanted to review them, but they would have to... Uh, uh, procure a copy themselves, or if they, if they asked us, we would send them one, but they, they never ask. Um, I, I suspect, actually, that uh, that uh, Bill's book was not widely appreciated. I mean, he, uh, uh, I think he, you know, he wasn't concerned only with the cultural coverage, but really with the, um, the fate of that, that great news organization uh, in the, over the last couple of decades. And the story he tells is really one that, um, as he puts it, really more out of so- sorrow than, than anything like uh, anger. I mean, he, uh, uh, you know, Bill is a journalist himself. He understands that the Times is a great newspaper, and he's sorry that it has allowed, um, on the one hand, uh, political ideology, and on the other hand, uh, a kind of um, slavish uh, passion for the merely trendy to destroy the newspaper. I think that... Um, uh, uh, he is not alone in seeing the quality of news reporting and the quality of cultural reporting in the Times, um, you know, sharply deteriorate over the last couple of decades, and especially over the last uh, five or six years. Encounter Books has a new title out called Confronting Terror, edited by Dean Reuter and John Yu, with the moving image on the cover of the searchlights that temporarily replace the Twin Towers in the New York skyline. Beyond commemorating the 10th anniversary of 9/11, what's the theme of the book? You know, obviously there are a lot of books uh, commemorating this um, this anniversary of the terror attacks on the United States. Um, I think this is uh, one of the very best. It's a collection of essays, very wide ranging. Um, it contains essays by everyone from Andrew McCarthy and former Attorney General Michael Mukasey to um, uh, you know the head of the ACLU. Uh, it's um, uh, a very wide-ranging book that that kind of looks back over all of what the United States has done since September 12, 2001, until the day before yesterday, to try to address this enormous national security problem that um, uh, terrorism confronts us with. Uh, it's, I think anybody who's um, interested in, in what's happened, what we should do as a nation, will, will want to take, uh, take a look at this book. It really is, is um, uh, full of, of interesting, interesting historical reflection. As far as what I think about 
how we're doing. I think that, uh, you know, um, the last president, President Bush, um, whatever criticisms one may have of him, I think he he uh, did a, a terrific job at um, uh, understanding that we were fighting a new enemy that meant us uh, ill and um, put in place many of the mechanisms that, that have uh, you know, prevented the United States from uh, being subject to another terror attack since then. Uh, you know, I think the, the war on terror is going pretty well, ex- to, but, uh, you know, there are, there are problems. I think we, we, have, um, we have difficulty as a generous people that we are uh, in understanding that there really are people out there who mean us ill and in, um, in understanding that, that Islam is... Um, uh, is not well. It, Islam is antithetical, really. I think to um, to a democratic liberal culture, as Gert Wilders put it. There may be moderate Muslims. Uh, indeed, there are probably millions and millions of moderate Muslims, but there is no such thing as moderate Islam, and that's difficult. I think for many well-meaning people to digest, but I believe it's the truth. Roger, last question. Every presidential election is called the most important in America's history, but there's no doubt that November of 2012 will be a pivotal one. Any thoughts on how it's shaping up on both sides of the aisle? Well, I think it, uh, you know, um, I think it's a very important uh, election. Uh, it may be one of the, maybe the most important in the, the uh, history of the republic. Uh, I think what we have um, uh, is pretty clearly drawn here is a, a line. On the one hand, you have uh, um, a kind of European socialist vision uh, that that uh, um, is fighting for greater state control uh, over the mechanisms of production and the uh, the metabolism of everyday life. Um, uh, that wants to do good, but wants to do good by a kind of centralizing of power and control of uh, the country by elites. That's one side. The other side uh, is um, uh, concerned to uh, diffuse power, to um, uh, allow markets to uh, do their job, uh, to unleash uh, business entrepreneurship, and basically uh, let people live their lives as they see best within the confines of the rule of law. That's the other side. Um, now, there's uh, obviously that's a somewhat tendentious way of putting it, perhaps, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's inaccurate. Um, uh, it seems to me that the last few years have um, been a incredible assault on the traditional idea of what America was, that is to say, uh, uh, a republic that valued limited government and uh, put a premium on individual responsibility and individual liberty. That Those are the values out of which uh, this country was formed. Uh, that has been challenged in the most fundamental possible way by uh, the current regime. And I think that um, the Tea Party is um, not only the most vibrant political phenomenon of our time in, in, in this country, uh, but is also informing many of the uh, uh, political candidates on the other side of the, of the fence. Um, I think it's really this next election is going to be uh, a referendum on the future of individual liberty and uh, free market capitalism. And... Uh, if it goes the wrong way, it's going to be uh, the United States will turn out to be a very different sort of country in uh, 10 years from what it is today. This is Ed Driscoll, and we've been talking with Roger Kimball, the editor of the New Criterion magazine, the publisher of Encounter Books, and a blogger here at pajamasmedia.com. And Roger, thank you for stopping by today, and congratulations on the 30th anniversary of the New Criterion, which you can read at www.newcriterion.com. Ed, thanks so much. It's great always to talk to you.